Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking Magazine's bi-weekly podcast. I'm your host and Fine Woodworking Editor, Tom McKenna. And with me this episode, our special projects editor, Matt Kenny. Hello, everyone. And Ben Strano, our web producer. Hello. And manning the cameras, as always, is Jeff Rose. Uh, Mike is not in the house this week. Before we get started, I need to take care of some business. This episode of Shop Talk Live is brought to you by the Type On Quick and Thick Multi-Surface Glue, the thickest, fastest-drying water-based glue available. In fact, it's two times faster and three times thicker than traditional PVA glues. Type On Quick and Thick can be used with porous and semi-porous materials, provides a strong initial tack, and allows for realignment of working pieces. Visit tightbond.com slash quick and thick to learn more. We yeah. can move on. And uh, we this is a, kind of a momentous occasion. Uh, I have earth-shattering news uh, to break. Uh, oh. oh, you can talk about getting, it? We're all getting raises. <laughs> <laughs> no, realistic. <laughs> yeah. this, is for the, this is for the listeners and readers. Uh, Fine Woodworking Live is coming back. Dun, dun, dun. So uh, save three. the dates for uh, we will be back on April 21st through the 23rd of 2017. Uh, it's going to be in Massachusetts. I don't want to reveal the place yet because all the paperwork has not yet been signed, but um, we are 99% a go. So we're going to start putting together the program. Um, it's going to be fun. It's, it's at a hotel and conference center. So it'd be pretty a nice much one. all, and yes, it'll yeah. be all inclusive. No more dormitories uh, or sweatshops. It's going to be a pretty, uh, pretty nice place. So I thought it was going to be at a guy named Murray's house. <laughs> 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 he was outside of Boston <laughs> in Dedham. Den- <laughs> what Dedham? Dedham? Dedham. Oh, Dedham. Dedham. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's how you pronounce it. <clears throat> with that in mind, keep an eye out for uh, the web for uh, on the web on the web for info about uh, the event as we start uh, updating it and getting the, all the packages together. Like I said, I think it's going to be pretty cool and fun. It's, so. it's just awesome that we can talk about it now. It is. <laughs> I've, I've actually had people ask me, it's like, I don't know. Yeah, well, we're working on something. It might Maybe. happen. No, it's, I'm excited that it's coming back because the first two were awesome. They uh, were. I mean, despite shortcomings of the location and the venue itself, um, I think the the I didn't I didn't make the first one I was away but I, I was involved in the second one and people loved it. Yeah, they were yeah. fantastic, a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. So, and the difference is for for this new one, you know, you're not going to have to drive uh, to go see, go to it. Everything's going to be right there. The yeah. Hotel, hotel, bar. Bar, mm-hmm. classes, pool, pool tables, <laughs> and in this meals, this pool, bar, vendors, <laughs> vendors, and bar. Bar. vendors, bars. <laughs> but this place also has a great uh, gym set up. Um, it's really, it's really so a that's, wonderful. That's key for spot. me. It's really nice. That's, I like yeah. nothing like more than working out with people I don't know. We're gonna, uh, well, no, there's a there's a <laughs> basketball court, so we can really get a little, you know, two on two. Uh, you know? Yeah, that'll be really or good. four on four. I can imagine editors a bunch of versus woodworkers are really good at basketball. <laughs> and, well, they do have a CPR uh, machine right. In the gym, so defibrillators. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. First on staff. <laughs> It'll be great. <laughs> Break class in, in case of emergency. Um, let's get to our first question. Uh, I'm this. Uh, this one comes from. Uh, boy, I didn't write the guy's name down. How <laughs> <laughs> sad. Uh, you take that. one episode off, and it just really falls I'm just, apart. You know, huh? jet lag. Anyway, uh, this gentleman says I'm considering adding an insulated floor to my garage workshop similar to what Mike did, but I need to be able to drive and park a car on one side of the garage. Is the design that Mike used, plywood over pressure-treated sleepers and rigid foam insulation, strong enough to support a vehicle? Do you have any ideas for how to create a garage floor that can be driven on but still has insulation value and would be more comfortable to walk and work on than the bare concrete slab? Now, for this answer, 
you know, since we're pretty much incompetent in this arena, we and reached out to <laughs> we reached out to someone who actually knows what they're talking about. Um, Patrick McComb, uh, our one of our colleagues at Fine Home Building, he's an associate editor. Uh, and Patrick we, started at Woodworking, right? That's true. I did. I washed out. <laughs> he was no, here for he, one washed year. up <laughs> <laughs> or washed over. Um, so Patrick is here to to give. Uh, we're going to get the the answer straight from the horse's mouth. Well, it's so great to, to be speak. here. Um, I had asked my boss if I could, you know, be on the show this morning. He said only if I plugged our fine home building <sighs> podcast. So I'm just going to get that out of the way. We plugged you last time. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Well, you know it's just going to get it's edited out. So <laughs> feel free to say whatever you want. It's just bonk, bonk, bonk. Yeah. So to answer this uh, gentleman's question, uh, theoretically this is possible. The materials are all uh, can be strong enough to support the weight of a car. But if you go to your uh, IRC, the International Redis- Residential Code, which uh, governs most people's building practices in uh, you know a residential setting, uh, the answer is no because garage floors have to be all non-combustible materials. So if you're talking about plywood or any kind of wood material, foam insulation, those don't fit the bill. So that's not going to work. Um, so if you, go ahead. Does that mean so if I have a, sh- a garage and I want to use it exclusively as a shop? Can I not do that kind of floor? Well, it would be best to um, make it so you couldn't park in there, right? That might mean just bolting your garage door closed or removing it. Mm -hmm. Um, The specifics of that, you'd want to talk to your local inspector about what they would expect you to do. But I'm sure one of those pillars like they have in front of 7-Eleven? Yeah, if you made it so you couldn't (laughs) park a car in there, um, that would probably be fine. Yeah. And by... You can't fill it up and say you can't park in it, right? Right. <laughs> so it has to yeah. be really made so you can't get a car inside. Right. Huh. So w- uh, what what can you do if you're going to what, – what, what should he do if he wants to insulate the floor? Well, he's either going to have to make his garage inaccessible for a vehicle, and uh, I would tell him to consider that seriously because cars are waterproof and park outside. Maybe the missus is not uh, in favor of that strategy, <laughs> but um, – you know, those mats are great, and that would satisfy the code. It wouldn't be a fire hazard. Um, someone asked me, could you insulate part of the floor uh, and leave the part uh, uninsulated where the car would park? Uh, no. <laughs> For two reasons. One, it wouldn't be effective if you had that cold spot. Right. Um, and secondly, you're still going to have those materials in the garage space, which is not allowed. What If you're plant, it's good to keep oh, so, in mind. So if you're- not even where... Where you where you're not parking. So if you have a two bay garage and you make one bay inaccessible to a car, you can't have anything flammable on the floor. That's correct. All told, that's correct. Would wow. would would it? Um, what if he closed off one wall? I mean, if that would be a potential s- a solution because once again, you're creating a space that's not su- suitable for a car to park in. So if you could do that, then that would probably be fine. Once now, again, you're going to want to talk to your inspector because that's up to them. Yes. They have a lot of uh, leeway in interpreting the rules. Yes, I, and, and codes vary from, you know, sometimes greatly from county to county, town to town. I actually have, you know, I re- we just moved in, and I have a small three-bay garage, we'll say. And uh, we're planning on walling off one bay for my wife to park in because somebody's gotten it in her head that it will be convenient to park in there. <laughs> and um, so I would need to actually make that a full wall, mm-hmm. then insulate the floor mm-hmm. in the workshop side. Um, or can I just get a note from you saying that my wife can't park in that side? I'll give you a note like that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that'll Notarized. work for you. <laughs> Sorry, um, Patrick says there, we you know, there, there might be other reasons that one shouldn't park in that particular garage, you know, structural considerations or tightness or, you know, what have you. You might want to think about possibly, yeah. Um, yeah. you know. It, it is a tight bay for her car, which is a tiny car, too, so. So, all right, so we get the official answer from Patrick. So here's something else to think about. Like, if you're planning to build a shop, you should insulate under the concrete before it's poured. It's going to cost a few hundred dollars, even if you don't want to heat the space later on. It's going to be ready for you. It's going to be an amenity if you want to sell the place that the, you know, the space could be heated or cooled quite easily. Mm-hmm. How insula- do you do that? With rigid foam again? Yeah, rigid foam Just insulation. Two inch or? Well, it depends on where you live. I would say two inches is, is a minimum, at least up here in New England. Um, more would be better in New England. It depends on where you live. Yeah, you got to talk to your contractor. And, one, and, yeah. and those rules are specified in the in the IRC as well. The, uh, you know, sub slab insulation is what that's described as, and it's so easy to do it before you pour the concrete. It's virtually 
impossible. Well, it is impossible. <laughs> well, you're going to get to break it up and put it down and then pour it again. So I wouldn't want to do that. Okay. Is that in, uh, so, you know, I'm from Florida where slab construction is mainstream. mainstream. It's all that pretty much anyone does mm -hmm. is, uh, unless you're doing a pool. And then it's, you know, you <laughs> right. the one reason they dig, dig a hole. Ground. That's the only reason they dig a hole in Florida. Um, and much of the country is like graves. That. Yeah, yeah. for graves, yeah. Um, thanks, Tom, for getting morbid. Um, <laughs> Bringing it down. So, but in, up here, I know that in, in New England, uh, most homes have uh, basements. So mm -hmm. slab construction isn't very common. Uh, but if you, so if I'm just building a shop out in my, in my yard, out in the, in the back 40, and I'm going to do slab construction, and I want to insulate it. Does that all have to be below the frost line, or so? Are you? Or is it only the the footings that have the to? The footings be? that support the walls are customarily below well, the frost yeah. line. The slab doesn't have, have to, to be. be. Um, there are ways that you don't need frost walls, but it's a little complicated to discuss. It's called a shallow frost protected foundation, and it uses insulation, so you don't have to go as deep. Or a treehouse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, uh, this is. Uh, I find this interesting. I'll talk about it to you later. So I'm, the I'm sure. the thing Treehouse. is, um, you yeah. know, you want the, you want to put that insulation down before you put the concrete, and then you want to put polyethylene sheet plastic six mil poly on top of that, and that's your vapor retarder. And if you do those two steps, you're going to have a much more comfortable shop, even if you don't condition it, because. Mm. Um, you know, in many climates, the garage slab is going to be the coldest thing in the room, right? It's yes. because it's in contact with the ground, which is pretty much the same temperature year round, right? Right. So if you're in a hot, humid place, you're going to have condensation on that concrete slab. Yeah. But if you if you have insulation under it, it's going to be the air temperature, not the soil temperature. So you're you're immediately uh, reducing the likelihood of having rust on your tools and especially machine bases. You know. Um, and the, the polyethylene, the sheet plastic, prevents um, water vapor, which the soil has a lot of moisture in it, and it always wants to move to a place where there's less moisture, right, which would be your garage yeah. shop. So if you put that plastic under the slab, you can stop a lot of that vapor drive, as we describe it in the building nerd community. Well, and, and in Star Trek, right? They have, <laughs> they have a vapor <laughs> drive. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, retrofitting, though. What is the best course of action? The way that Mike did it, where he's got sleepers down. We're with... assuming that this is a shop only, and yes. not we're not going to park a car in there. So right. if we do that, we want to still have a vapor retarder, right? Uh, a good way to do that is sheet plastic. If you tape the seams and try not to put a bunch of holes in it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing you could do is paint the slab before putting down your sleepers and insulation, and that's going to do a similar uh, function in stopping vapor drive. Latex paints work better than oil-based paints because they do allow a little vapor transmission, so it's less likely that water vapor would force off the paint in big pieces. Oh, okay. Which would happen with, you know, that's common with, like, really thick paints people like to use in shops, like epoxies and stuff like that, because they're so vapor impermeable. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thanks uh, for the great info. Yeah, I, I hope think, uh, uh, he enjoys his shop, and I hope his wife learns to uh, accept the car is outside. Yeah. Maybe a carport or one Kick of those like little tent things you could put up over the car. Those tent oh. things are really starting to look classy. Yeah. They're really they, classy. They, they, they're everywhere. So yeah, I think I think your boss is knocking on the window. You can get with, <laughs> you can get with gold on them now, like gold, you know, and then like the doors. Gold they look like, look like barn doors when they close them. They look really nice. I saw something really cool <laughs> for your <laughs> audience recently, which is a. Um, a garage door that's a big screen. I don't know. You guys should look into yeah, that. It yeah. looks really cool. Yeah. Cool. I was being tremendously sarcastic about the... I was being serious about the screen, the screen door. Yeah, that's that's cool. That is cool. That yeah. is cool. But the, 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 the tents that you put your car under... I have one of those. Cool. I bet you can get. Do you know you don't? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Patrick. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks that was again. my pleasure. Anytime. Yeah. Peace out. Yeah. Right, See man. you guys later. Thank yeah, you, See you, Patrick. Well, that was great info from Mr. McComb. Let's get to question number two. This one comes from Michael, and Michael writes, After nudging my bandsaw fence a little too close to the blade, I managed to come into contact with the blade and scored a kerf line on the fence. Workpiece is now catch slightly on this groove whenever I'm pushing through a cut. My fence is extruded aluminum. Is there anything I can do to get this groove out and return it to flat without having to visit a machinist? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. But, but before we tell him how to do this, I think we should actually say something else. Yeah. Here don't, don't. we go. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, right? 
Which is, it's probably really Mike Pekovich. He plays <laughs> synthesis and Mike. That's why he's not here this week. <laughs> he he took the whole week <laughs> off. He got a teaching gig right. as, a, as a cover. So, Michael, you should not have a kerf in your bandsaw fence because you should not be adjusting your bandsaw fence well, with on. the bandsaw yes. on. So, Safety in the future, first. don't do that. Hey, wood, woodworking is inherently dangerous. Yes, and it's even more so <laughs> when you do things. I love that, that line. Uh, yeah, it's aluminum is very soft. As far as metals go, mm-hmm. so you could. Uh, the, I think you you want to first do as little harm as possible, uh, and when you try to correct it, so I would just try to deburr it. Just run, uh, get a sanding block and some fine grit sandpaper, and just run a few times over the length of the fence and see. Just get the burr knocked down. Yeah, and uh, then you should be fine. I the unless it's a really huge gouge. Your wood should just yeah. uh, slide right over a, a small kerf of the sort that a bandsaw blade would probably put in the fence. Especially adjusting it parallel to the blade, so it can't be much of a gouge. Yeah, it yeah should, I, I'd yeah. imagine yeah. that it's not that bad. But, but um, if it is much of a gouge, I would maybe fill it with some epoxy putty and then could, sand yeah. that down. Yeah, yeah you could so do that. You're, yeah. you're flush. Could also put an auxiliary fence on it, like an MDF yep. fence. Yeah, that's what I, in fact, I was, that's what he should do is <laughs> if he insists on adjusting the fence with the table, with the blade running, then yeah, put an auxiliary fence on. And then the next time you cut into it, you can just chuck it and replace it with another one, mm-hmm. you know, but again, don't adjust your fence with the saw running. Yeah. Turn it off. He probably knows that already. <laughs> he, probably <laughs> he probably learned. He probably learned. I mean, he's probably learned that by now, but yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's get to the next question. This one comes from Cameron, and Cameron says, I'm looking to buy my first set of chisels as well as sharpening stones and honing guide. What would you recommend buying in terms of sharpening stones and flattener, diamond flattener? I want to buy a good set of stones, but I don't think I can afford all at one time. If I have to buy two stones, what grits should I buy first, 1,000, 4,000, 8,000? Also, should I try to buy the diamond flattener at the same time as the first two stones? Getting into sharpening can, I mean, getting into any woodworking is expensive. It's expensive. Sharpening is expensive. It can be. But it is going to affect every tool in your arsenal. Yes. So it's it's probably the thing that it makes the most sense to spend money on initially. It's one of the first hand tools you buy, really. Right. And well, so, it's, it's probably the one of the last hand tools most people buy, it, and then they regret it as soon as they they regret waiting as like such as me. Mm-hmm. I I just dropped a bunch of money on a set of stones and a flatter and everything. It was just why did I wait so long? Yeah, we yeah, don't know. I mean, as soon as I bought up my, my first hand plane, <laughs> I bought a set of sharpening stones. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I bought. I mean, the I find the Norton uh, combo stones are a pretty good value if you're starting out. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to. I, I do want to. After using some of the Shapton stones, I do want to kind of upgrade at some point, but um, they're relatively inexpensive and you can buy the flattener that comes with it. Yeah, it's not a com- good starting point. It's not a bad starting point. The Nortons. Yeah, yeah. you can get yeah. a Norton yeah. combo set for probably 100, 125 bucks and you yeah. get the 1,000, 4,000, 8,000 stones. You can get the Norton flattening stone, however... Wait, 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 wait. You're buying for... A little over 100, 140, to, I think I you think just said. Right. Yeah, for, I think that's what I paid. For like. 1,000, 4,000, and 8,000? And no, well, it was, it was 200, 200, 1,000, 4,000, okay. 8,000. All right. Cool. Uh, you can do that. Never use the 200 grit I because they're too it. soft. It, yeah. uh, in the Norton flattening stone thing they sell, I would pass that I, based I, on personal experience and get yeah. a diamond plate like he wants right. to. I, I did upgrade. I, I bought that that flattening plate, and, it, and and I think it worked fine, but when I had a chance to get the diamond flattening plate, I did it. Yeah, the the but this guy said he wanted Shapton stones, right? Um, no, he he said he. he I think that was his dream. Yeah. Uh, well, so if you know, I now always encourage people it, to save the money and buy what you want and buy the good thing first. Don't spend money on the cheap thing because it's what you can afford. Because you're just going to replace it. And it'll end yeah. up costing you more money. So if I this is his first set of chisels. Yeah. So he's he's pretty new to the craft. I get it. 
Yeah. And dropping five hundred dollars on a set of stones and a sharpening. But you don't have to drop five hundred dollars on a set of stones. That's I mean, no. I don't know where you bought your stones. Was it, you know, on the street corner in New York City? <laughs> I got them from mean, Mike. You got them from Mike, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That explains it. Um, That's why Mike is on vacation. <laughs> yeah, Mike's yeah, he took all the money he He's made got a lot selling of yeah. sharpening stones <laughs> and went to Paris. Um you can get two sharpening stones and a flattening plate. Listen, I bought for approximately 300 bucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I bought a uh, 1,000 grit stone, a 6,000 grit stone, a, uh, a 13,000 grit stone. Mm-hmm. It came with a diamond stone. It came with a little sharpening pond to put them mm-hmm. in. It came with a little squeeze bottle to put water in. And it came from Japan. So it was in right now, if it, the yen was was just going down to the dollar. So it was getting even like down around 250 for that set. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's not a lot of money to invest in a sharpening, a really good sharpening setup. I totally agree. I totally agree that that's a great amount of money for a great set. But But that is a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah, But you're going to spend it. I mean, I don't think there's any way around it, you know, like Matt said, you don't necessarily want to go too cheap. And I, and I bought that starter set for, you know, I think it was around 140. I, I yeah, it. I had them too. And now I'm looking to get something different. So, well, it's not that I, I, the, 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 the Nortons are good stones, but I, I just found that they did not do as well with a two as they did with mm-hmm. O one. And <laughs> most of my tools are a two. Yeah. And, uh, that's why I ended up moving away from them. But you, Norton's a good place they're to fine. start, yeah. and you can mm-hmm. use them and kill them. And yep. when they're dead, you know, you, then you can go out and get something else. So Norton would be a fine place to start. Yeah, I'm. I'm just looking to upgrade more because I don't. I, I get tired of the the soaking of the yeah. stones. I, I want to. When yeah, I need to sharpen, you I do pull have that's really out. just an inconvenience. Which right. Exactly, is worth it's, saving it's money. It's not performance you know. related. Modern, it's just yeah, modern ceramic stones like shaped and glass stones are these. Uh, Sigma Power Select stones that I have do not need to be soaked. Yeah, they just get spritzed with water. Um, but you, if I were to get two stones, like he asked, uh, there's a very there's actually a very common way of not common. But there's a common thought of uh, it is common, I guess, uh, approach to sharpening, which is you only have two stones. Mm-hmm. You have like a thousand and an eight thousand, mm-hmm. and you skip the medium. Uh, so that's you could start. You're that just gonna way. spend a little bit more time on the eight thousand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, I, back in the day, I got the 1,000, 4,000 combo stone and used honing compound. But to do it again, I think I'd get the 1,000, 8,000. Right. Yeah. And, and you do want uh, a diamond plate right away. You do want something to... You don't have to get a diamond plate. <clears throat> you know, this guy... You don't have to get the die flat right away, I would think. There's the die sharp. Yeah, this is yeah. a diamond plate. Yeah, it's yeah. just, you know, it's much... Much yeah. more inexpensive. You don't have to get the huge one. You don't have yeah. to get the ten by three. Like I have I just one got. Uh, that's made by I think it's called Atama, mm-hmm. and it's from Japan. And I think now Lee Valley sells them, yeah. and they're guaranteed flat to a ridiculous amount, and they do a great job. Mm-hmm. But you could also flatten your water stones on a piece of granite, right? And then if you got a piece of granite, you could also do some of your sharpening at the low end with uh, sandpaper, and then move to a four thousand, eight thousand. I, you know, I really would recommend the the flattening stone though, just because you have to have a flat. Well, to. but but to as as opposed to a piece of granite with, with uh, sandpaper, uh. just because it is so messy. Yeah, it can be messy, and you're gonna put it off. And the most important thing, especially when using Nortons, to me, is keeping them flat because they do not they they need to be flattened just about every time you use them. Yeah, that's what I, I do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. before I use and them, I flatten if, them. If you make it difficult it's, to flatten them, you're gonna find a way to. Excuse yeah. yourself from flattening. It doesn't take long to flatten the stones. You know, it's it's five minutes of work to do, yeah. you know, both combos for me. But if you have a good stone yeah. to flatten them with. So. It is lamentable that the, the 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 cost of getting into woodworking is, yeah. is tough. And even if you buy used stuff, you know, it's like I always say, you're going to spend money, time, and frustration on every tool that you get. And you have to decide which one you want to spend more of. Mm-hmm. So if you buy old used stuff that really has to be can work to get flat, so you can use it, et cetera, you know that's what you're gonna that's what you're gonna end up spending. And or you can spend money to get a new tool that's already in good condition. And the same goes with I think sharpening. It's like you're, yeah, you got to spend money. Yeah. You, you can't shortchange it. 
Yeah, even on the used tools, you, you want to buy good stuff. And even if there's labor involved... Um, you want to minimize you, the... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You want to start off with a good foundation of a tool. Mm -hmm. So are we done? I don't know. So. Right. So yeah. let's, let's move on to uh, our first segment. It's time for our all-time favorite furniture of all time for uh, this week. Who wants to hit it first? I don't know. You guys go first. I'm going to go last. Me? All right. Um, I have always loved the trestle table form, but I never found one that I could see having in my house. Um, and, you know, there's that sh classic shaker trestle table. But uh, in issue 235, Daniel Chafin. Dan Chafin. Of has Louisville, Kentucky. With beautiful photographs, by the way. And those are amazing photographs. Yeah. But um, a trestle table with modern appeal. This this table just, it's that classic form, um, and it's not too out there, but there's just a lot of subtlety to it. Uh, the little tapers on the uh, the radius around the edge and everything. It's very appealing, and it's also quite modern. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I I just think it's absolutely beautiful. It's 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 one of the first tables that. Or it's the only table that I saw that was like I want to build that exact table. And, and that one of the one of the great things about his table that that Chafin explained in the article, if I'm remembering the remembering it correctly, was how he creates that um, tapered bevel on yeah, the underside. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's a great technique. Right. Yeah. First, he uh, cuts the bevel onto the straight side, and then he hand planes in a, a subtle arc. Yeah. Into the uh, table edge which creates this uh a, a, a bevel of different height as, as it travels along the edge it's really fan it's a beautiful table it's it's and that aspect of it is like that that yeah. topper that just just drives it home for me and i actually use that technique on a side table that i'm working on right now on the aprons mm -hmm. uh almost as practice for doing yeah. this because uh, I know I'm, I'm going to want to do that when I build this. Yeah, Dan's a great designer. And, you know, I like the double stretcher at the top uh, instead of a single stretcher. Yep. The double stretcher just adds a little more uh, shadow and mm -hmm. light and a little more interest to it. And and, and I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to no, interrupt your thought. I, I, what I really like um, about the stretcher assembly are the post where – you know, most folks, and probably me included, would have the the wider portion on the bottom, and he reverses it in essence, where it's thin at the bottom and, and tapers up, tapers to a wider width at the uh, at the top. It's kind of a mm -hmm. it's 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 very cool looking. My my only thing is uh -oh. that bottom stretcher being so close to the ground. I live in an old house with old wood floors, and uh, I worry about that hitting. So I would just probably raise that up half no, an inch or so. No, no, don't raise it up. It's just not just the right table for you. Get it. <laughs> just move on. Move, get it. Get move. a different house. Your house is not good <laughs> enough for that <laughs> table. <laughs> yeah. Dan and Dan's a really smart furniture maker. And uh, I always I shot that article and I shot another one with him. I love going to Louisville. Yeah, there's uh it didn't make it. There's uh some classic shots I I feel like that uh didn't make it in here. I'll I'll have to uh get them to Jeff for the video and uh classic, classic shots. shots. Yeah, it's it's beautiful shots with a tool tool cabinet behind them table. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that photograph. That back yeah. window, it's beautiful shots. Oh, so. I thought there was something from Matt's hotel visit or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't need to see any of that. It was when I was streaking down <laughs> Churchill Downs. He's not allowed to go back to Louisville. <laughs> yeah. Could never go back. Banned. Yeah. That's a good pick. That's a nice table. Thank you. Me? Mm. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm kicking it old school today because I um, one of the benefits of working at Fine Woodworking is that, you know, we have a pretty good a collection of... Joy. Love that, too. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a big shop. It's awesome. But um, we have a pretty good collection of furniture that was made in the early days. And one thing that I walk past every day is Tayfrid's three-legged stool. And... That appeared in issue number seven. Seven, seven. big seven. Um, it's the the cover that has the loot rose on mm. it. 
But uh, this is, it's really funny because this, this stool is really comfortable and it's one of the oddest looking things when I first saw it. I didn't necessarily know what to think about it, think of it. But when you read the article and the article really just focuses on Tay's design process and how he came about it. And um, there's just some great quotes in the article that, that I just wanted to share during, for his design process. Um, he says, when I started designing my seat, I did not have in mind at all that I wanted to make a three legged stool but as the design progressed, I did not have any choice. And I just love that, you know. He just wanted something comfortable, and he didn't know exactly how it was going to uh, going to turn out. But one of the great things about, and I don't mean to belabor the article too much, but um, the article, for the most part, is talking about the design. And all you really get to build the, the piece is this. this. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some you know, essential dimensions on uh, the second page. This is a three page article about making this elaborate stool. Um, I actually have it sitting behind me, but uh, one of the things that really makes it and it's classic Danish modern are the oval shaped legs and stretchers. You know, when you look at them from one angle, they look like they might just be standard round legs. And that's one of the designs that one of the design aspects that Tay changed was in his first mock up, he had turned legs and he just felt he had the height right. He had the comfort right and the seat shape right, but he felt something was off. And then it, it kind of just dinged him that, oh, you know, I've got to I make these ovals and everything mm -hmm. works out. And it's just beautiful, you know, through joinery, uh, very detailed. And one other aspect of it that I love when I first saw it is it has this narrow back that's connected to the seat with, with dovetails. And I thought when I first saw it, I was like, wow, you can use a dovetail joint for a seat back. Um, it's just, it's so light and sturdy. If I could reach it, I would pick it up. Oh, look at that. You can reach it. There pick it is. It Show it to everybody. Yeah. That sits uh, up in the entry w in the front, uh, the front reception area at, at Taunton, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and it's something, you know, it's it sits in the corner and, and it just, it's, I've seen it for so many years that it just doesn't jump out at me anymore. But then I realized, wow, you know, it's a perfect opportunity to, uh, to, to bring it to the fore. Yeah, it, when we walk by and I go to lunch every now and then, I just look, it's like, that's a legendary piece right there. You and know? It, and it, it is one of, you know, we've had visitors here uh, and I've met people in the lobby and I have to say, this is the piece that, I often, when I go down to meet the person, they're looking at this piece or touching it, you know, and it's like, well, I guess it's... And they're going, what is that? What is that? Hit can I hit the ruler? <laughs> leave it! Don't leave it! Do not touch. So. No, I sit in this chair actually quite a bit. I get on there and sit in it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> when the lights are off. <laughs> no, I mean, I do get on and sit in it, but I I have to say, it's, it's, a, it's a cool looking stool. Yeah. I do not find it comfortable. No? No. I'm a little too substantial to, to sit in it. I'm worried that I'd break it. No, I don't find it comfortable to sit back on necessarily. So I'm kind of with you there, but I, I, it's a good, it's a comfortable height for me. I mean, being kind of a, a short pole, but uh, yeah, Chris Bexford says that Shakers made 20 minute chairs because they didn't want people getting comfortable and sitting because they needed to be Get working, up. and so they made their uh, chairs to really they're not very comfortable past 20 minutes huh. uh and they're not shakers chairs are very straight and the they don't back. look comfortable yeah no. and this stool i think is sort of along that lines is it comfortable yeah you could sit in it for a little while but i would not want to have i mean there's yeah there's no back to it it's a stool so there wouldn't be a yeah. back we're not but, gonna find this in your cube but you can sit, but you no. can sit both ways on this one which is you can turn around when you want to have a rap session with the kids exactly. <laughs> all right you're grounded <laughs> No. Yeah. Anyways. So that's yeah, it's, uh, a, it's a beautiful chair, though. That's Ch mine. Stool. I'm going back to the archives. It's also just fantastic because it's in black and white, and we well, all know that black that and white too. is inherently better, better than yeah. color. Mm -hmm. It rocks. And so many people told that's, the magazine that's the only thing that I would change about Daniel Chaffin. <laughs> it should be in black, black and white. We'll photocopy it. Yeah. There hey. you go. Bada bing. All that's right. why he's the editor. All right. So is it Time. my turn? Yep. Get it over with. All right. So I'm going to get grief for this. But, um, not, for, uh, not for me. So one, I think one of the things as woodworkers, as furniture makers, we struggle with is when you make something yourself, 
to look past the mistakes. Oh no. And see everything that you did right. <laughs> so my favorite piece all time this week is, is something, yours. something that I made. Wasn't it was it Saturday Night Live had had that segment Deep Thoughts? <laughs> yes. So, no, that's that's Mike's Instagram feed. <laughs> yeah. So my favorite piece of all time this week is this little tea cabinet box that I made re, uh, earlier this year. And it is beautiful. I the reason I'm picking it is because I was one being lazy this morning, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but two, it's something that uh, when I was done with it. I looked at it and went, well, I can't say what I said because you'll bleep it out. But I said, bonk, bonk, bonk. I, I said, holy, <laughs> bleep. you know, how, how did I make that? Where did, you know, where did that come from? And it was probably the first time ever that I've made something that when I was done, it completely uh, overwhelmed me that I, that, that it actually was something that I had produced. So, uh, and there are things that are wrong with it. But I don't see the things that are wrong with it. All I see is what I got right. And I tell that to students all the time that, they, you know, they'll get in a five-day class and they'll say, oh, look at this gap here and look at this gap here. And I'll say, yeah, but look, you made a bow front cabinet yeah. with, a, you know, a curved door and it all goes together and the door closes properly. You know, so that's pretty amazing. So forget yeah, about no it. No one's looking at the gappy dovetail. Yeah, the no drawer. one's looking yeah. at the gappy dovetail and you shouldn't either. Yeah. So... Uh, for me, that's, I kind of, and I've, I've been seeing this piece a lot in my house recently and, uh, I'm about to ship it off to the person that bought it. Oh, that stinks. And, uh, I have to make another one for another customer. And so I've been thinking about it a lot recently. And I mean, if I'm being honest, it's my favorite piece of furniture right now. Yeah. Of, of all Sweet. the stuff I've seen, uh, even of Mike's stuff, uh, which most people don't know, Mike, most of Mike's furniture is only quarter scale. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know that. <laughs> the the thing that, that I love about this piece is especially doing it in the 52 boxes progression is that you see this is kind of the culmination. This is you see these themes start and work their way throughout and then this is where everything came together. Yes, I, where yeah. your shadow lines, the poles, the, the subtle Kumiko, the fabric behind the Kumiko, um, everything, the, the steps, the, the different boxes of scale, you know, it, everything comes together in this one piece. And it was like, bam, okay. You, that was the period on the end of that sentence, except you had one more piece after. <laughs> <laughs> one more, I had one more box after. One that. more. I guess it was box more. 51. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was a, it was a, the culmination in... It also, though, is now the what I can strive to again. You know, it's like it's it. Part of the whole reason I did that whole thing was to push myself forward as a designer, and now I have a new starting place. Mm -hmm. You know, now when I when I go back and start designing things again, uh, that's where I'm starting. Yeah. You know, as opposed to where I start before. But I don't know. Sure, is it? Am I being a little self absorbed? Sure. I don't care. Though. You know what? Uh, I it's, like it. It's, it it's good to do every well, now and then. It's though. funny because I look at some of, the, like it your head. some of the first pieces I make. And, you know, if you change uh, Matt's, the tone of Matt's quote about, wow, I made that, to like, wow, I made that. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> that's how I look Spe at some of my earlier pieces. Like, yeah. Oh, right. I spent that's that pretty much nasty. time on that. <laughs> it's like, right. Oh, that's a big waste of time. But it's funny. There are a couple of pieces I, I'm interested in remaking. Um, just because it was before I really learned the subtleties of wood of, of woodworking and you know in terms of thicknessing of thickness of parts and just dimensions, so there are a couple of pieces I'd, I'd like to revisit in my spare time. But well, that's an awesome box. Yeah. Well, you know. Anyways, but my my real message is: don't be afraid to be proud of your own stuff. Yeah. You know. Sing it loud, sing it proud. That's right. You know, when when you take it in the house and your spouse tells you that it's beautiful, don't point out all the mistakes. Just accept that it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's hard. It's accept hard to people do. Like it, it is hard to do. It's very hard to take those kind of compliments about your own work, but you should, because I mean, if you make something like a table, you know, and it doesn't fall apart, I mean, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because most of us are more or less incompetent boobs, so. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I don't even know. I'm not, I can't even reply yeah. to that. Um, let's get back to our list of questions. This one comes from Chris, and he says, I recently acquired a nice, huge cortisone sycamore board that I plan to make a couple of bedside tables with. I'd like to maintain the light color of the wood, and in my experience, most finishes turn the wood yellow. Also, when I've worked with sycamore, the finish raised the grain pretty severely, and I had trouble getting a truly smooth surface. Any good tips to achieving good finish results would be great. Hmm. Well, it's hard to prevent yellowing. I think wood is just going to age and change color naturally Yeah. Uh, no matter what finish you use. But I think we were, we, we were talking about this yesterday. We were talking about some of the water-based finishes mm -hmm. uh, work better at preserving yeah, water based preventing poly, yellow yeah. uh, would would probably be the best thing to present prevent the ambering that some finishes because right. you know oil yeah. based finishes can amber a wood Im immediately. Uh, and you said it's for a tabletop, right? A bedside table. Bedside table. I mean, so you could do uh, like a water based poly. Mm -hmm. The other thing you could do is get super blonde or clear shellac flakes. You want you want to use really fresh shellac, I think here. And uh, mix it up yourself. And I have found that clear shellac put, imparts very little color to wood. So you could use that. And if you use fresh shellac, uh, it'll be durable enough uh, for a bedside table, for sure. And easy to refresh if you need and to. And easy to refresh. And, yeah. you know, like me, if a lot of times I like to have a... a an, I use an insulated cup of water, and I'll have that on my bedside table at night. Uh, so if you're going to do that, you know, shellac will still be fine, but you might, you know, use an insulated cup, uh, or like get a, a coaster, turvis, a, or get a coaster. Yeah. Um, but a turvis cup is fine. And it really, uh, fresh shellac is very uh, resistant to water actually. Um, yeah. Do you, do you know what a turvis cup is? No idea. A turvis is a, it's a company <laughs> and they make these oh. really cool, uh, insulated cups and it, I don't know. I've always I, maybe they. I assume they sell them at places like Bed Bath and Beyond, but they're very popular in the South because they're double walled and clear. And, and so they, a lot of times they have roll tie on them. They'll have roll tie. <laughs> or, you know, I have ones with the you know, Florida Gator logo inside yeah. it. And they, but they also come in you know in uh, fashion forward designs. You know, like that my wife buys. But they're great cups, and they really do work. They keep stuff cold. <laughs> Um, that was a good aside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, the other thing he, he asked about was uh, he said he's having trouble getting the surface smooth. Yeah. Because of the grain. And a lot of finishes will raise the grain. Yeah. Uh, and I guess I don't, I've, I've used cortisone sycamore. I've never noticed it to be a particular hairy or fuzzy wood. But um, you can start with a clear coat of shellac. And uh, then sand after that, and that should get rid of any raised grain problems. Or I, you spritz it down with water and raise the grain and then sand it down. But you're going to have yeah. to sand the yeah. grain down. You really should be bit. sanding anyways after you do your first, yeah. after, and really in between every coat. And that should take care of any yeah. fuzziness. It yeah. really should. Should be not. It should not be a problem. It makes me wonder if maybe when he had that problem, if he didn't sand to a high enough grit. Initially, if you stopped at maybe 120 or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's possible. But if you sand, if even you, like finisher, professional finishers say, they don't say, if you're going to bring me something, make sure you get up to 400. What they want is just, if you bring me something, make sure it has a consistent scratch pattern. Yeah. And they're not really they concerned yeah. about the grit because they can, once you start putting on the, <clears throat> excuse me, once you start putting on the finish, it, it's the finish that becomes the thing that right. you feel. It's the yeah. working surface. And yeah. so if the underlying wood's a little rough, it kind of in a way goes away once you put enough finish on it. It might be a quarter inch thick, but. <laughs> it's funny. One thing that, that struck me. <laughs> 12 yeah, coats of poly. <laughs> you do get a, a lot of people who, who write in talking about how to preserve um, the initial color of the wood that they're using. And I, I sort of like the way the wood yeah, ages. Wood and I, ages. I, I mean, it's really like I made a, a small uh, white oak cabinet with a fold-down door that, out of spalted maple. And so um, at first there was a kind of a big contrast between the maple and, and the oak. But now after a couple of years, you know, the, the maple has aged to like a nice deep yellow and, and or 
kind of not yellow, but kind of a more of a brownish, and it's right. really melded <clears throat> with the white oak and how that's aged over time. And it, and even with the pieces out of maple that I've built, I kind of like the yellowing aspect of it. I, and that that you're never going to stop wood from changing. Right. It's right. always going to look different years from now than it, than it did when you started. But if you do like the color of a piece of wood or something like that, and you don't want to add that amber, I, I think water-based poly is the best yeah. way of preserving the actual color. It adds very little character. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, you know, that amber look is what we consider character in a finish. But if you're really trying to preserve that, that color, water-based poly and keep it inside under a tarp. Yeah. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't let any, don't the sunlight get on it. Yeah. Uh, but that's one of the, I mean, one of the challenges of designing with wood, using wood, is that you can't think about what does it look like right now. That's hard. You have to think yeah. about what what does cherry look like ten years from now, and so what woods are going to look nice with it ten years from now. Garrett uh, Hack touched on this in his article from several years ago about using contrasting woods. And uh, it's one of the things, like, for example, I think it's why people believe that Purple Heart and Maple look good together. Uh, that Because you have this cool purple wood next to this really white mm-hmm. maple. But they don't stay. I mean, Purple no. Heart turns brown, brown. and maple starts to uh, become sort of a pumpkinish, brownish color. And it's like, they don't look so good together. And... Uh, so you have to think about wood in terms of what it's going to look like down the road and not what it looks like right now. Yeah, and that only comes from experience, really. Yes, yeah. 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 All right, well, we're uh, kind of running short on time, so we should move on to a brand-new segment that we're rolling out this episode. It's time for our all-time favorite fine woodworking article of all time Ooh, I've for this brought week. brought wood. What Get magazine? Out. Popular <laughs> Mechanics? You're, you're fired. <laughs> uh, who wants to kick I, it off? I'm going to start because I went last the other time. Yeah, but you volunteered for that. Yeah, but now I'm volunteering to go first. All right. <laughs> Rock it out. So one of my favorite, when I when I interviewed for this job, uh, some I can't remember how this transpired, but anyways, I showed up and I had in my mind a list of like 10 articles that I really liked. And it worked out well because Asa asked me what my favorite fine woodworking articles were. <laughs> and I can't remember if he told me that I should know that or if I just thought I should know that. Um, and one of them is uh, uh, this article by Chris Bexford from the year 2000. And, and which, year 2000. 2000. I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> I love that bit. Uh, but uh, it's hard to believe that was... The year 2000 looked this date dated now because, I mean, you, it could have easily been the 1980s uh, based on the pictures. But um, it's an article about keeping plank doors flat. And Chris talks about five different strategies on how to make a plank door and keep it flat. I mean, I'm learning something from it right there on the just glancing at this, that dovetail buried yeah yeah the slide, incredible. Like it's like yeah. a sliding dovetail batten yeah. yeah it's buried into the wood um and there one it's re- there's some really cool things in here that i didn't wouldn't have thought about like that dovetailed key that slides into the back of the door yeah or cleats on the inside of the door so you resaw the door apart uh route out some uh dados and put cleats inside there and then glue the door back together Wow. Yeah, it's like these really cool techniques. That's crazy talk. To uh, Because I like, uh, I mean, frame and panel looks all right. To, I like frame and panel doors, but to me, when I look at a frame and panel door, it makes me think of what I would call period furniture, which is anything made before 2000. <laughs> 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 yeah, like arts and crafts, shaker furniture. Mm-hmm. That's all period furniture. And I, really modern furniture at times, a, a frame and panel door can look strange. Uh, yeah. When something's really yeah. clean and really minimal, you want to have uh, just a a, a, a a plank. And I went to making uh, plywood with shops on veneer doors, and that mm-hmm. was how I got around it. Mm-hmm. But Chris has these fan, five fantastic ways to do it. And it was just, I, re- I remember reading this, and I was just like, my mind was blown. Like, yeah. yours was blown when you saw that picture. Yeah, I, I, 
Yeah. But then also I like it because there's a picture of Chris's belt sander. Uh, belt sander. That's a love beast. It. Which looks like uh, something that you would see like maybe in like Flash a, Gordon. Flash Gordon or it's a the truck. Rocketeer. It's a locomotive yeah. out of, uh, you know, Firefly, <laughs> that TV show uh-huh. or uh, maybe Sin City or something. You know, it's just like this totally crazy. And he's using it to sand these battens down uh, flush with the surface. And I can just think now, if you were to run that now, the hissy fit that it would cause, you know, people. Oh, I love it when people are, aren't afraid to pull out the belt center. Like Kevin Rodell. Yeah. In the, in the, it's a in tool. his uh, last video workshop, it just goes to town with the belt center. It's just. Gets yeah. the job done. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. But well, it's funny that you brought this up because I went back to this article a few weeks ago because I'm, I'm building this cabinet on stand and I. I had originally drawn in a frame and panel door, and then I thought, why? And I I realized, I remembered that Chris, I don't think I remembered it was Chris as the author, but I knew we had done this plank door article, and I went back to it, and I said, you know, I can do this. So I think I'm going to use, the, I'm, I'm leaning toward the dovetailed key. That's mm-hmm. so cool. So, and I can use a really nice um, board, like a nice figured board without any kind of, frame interruption around it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I have high hopes. I have to admit now I think that I would not, if if I were to do any of these, I would do the one where you resaw the plank and you put uh, uh, cleats inside it yeah. and glue it back together. But I actually I have to admit I would probably do a door like this now because that's how I do it. I would do it with, uh, start off with a plywood core mm-hmm. and uh, use shops on veneer mm-hmm. and uh, shops on edge banding. And make it that way. Yeah. Yeah, I was just at Tim Coleman's, and he does a really, really nice plywood door with all veneered surfaces and everything. It's just really slick and modern looking. <clears throat> but I do think for the awe factor, when you open up that that door, that dovetailed key is just... It's, it's yeah, yeah, it's, it, a, it's, it's a, a bit of visual interest. interest. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's my... First ever That's a great one. all-time favorite article of well, all time I haven't read this it. week. It might, it might be horrible when I read it. But. <laughs> no, it's not horrible. <laughs> what it's is great. Fine woodworking. Are you kidding me? <sighs> awesome back cover, too, on that issue. That is a great yeah, back cover. Yeah. Um, well, I'll I'll jump in and I'll try. It's issue 145, by the way. You just said you know, we just said it was a great back cover. Oh. So we should tell people what issue it was. Issue 145. Good point. Well, mine, uh, my article comes from issue 239, and it's, uh, the article title is Uncommon Arts and Crafts, written by John Binzen, and this article, I just, I just loved it, because I, I do like arts and crafts furniture, um, but it's not my, my specialty or my cup of tea in terms of building, but the what I loved about this the approach that this article took is John eliminated like the really familiar names you green know, and green green and green Frank Stick Lloyd Wright green. and focused on the outliers hmm. and what I mean just on the first spread I had no idea what the original Morris chair really looked like and suddenly I saw it I was like wow it wasn't that wide you know white oak you know, armrest and uh, slatted back, it was this upholstered piece mm-hmm. um, with wheels and really, really <laughs> funky. And then you see kind of, kind of an evolution or a different taste, take on it. And then the next page, you go into all these, you know, the, like the Eng- English country arts and crafts, and you get another huge flavor of different forms of arts and crafts pieces. And then you think you're done. No, no, we're going off to the Asian influence. And then... Um, organic carved pieces and then gothic, you know, bold gothic pieces. And maybe you're done. Nope, there's one more. <laughs> <laughs> and then it goes into even more like pencil, what he calls Pennsylvania Gothic and Cat Seals Colony. And it's just this broad um, taste of it and these wonderfully written paragraphs about the evolution of the, the design and a brief picture of the maker. It's um, it's one of the better design articles that, that I think we've done, in my opinion. Yeah. It's in 239. 239. Which also has a great back cover. Danny Cameras. And a great front cover. Chris oh, Bexford. Chris Bexford. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's, what's the back cover? Danny okay. Cameras. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Splash. Yeah. Splash. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I was... All right. I guess I'm up next. Um, yes. Mine is from... Issue 228. It better not be a pick of a article. It's not. 
It's a Schofield article. What? And it is how to fix flaws and mistakes. And I remember reading this the first time and it kind of, the techniques are really good, but it just kind of cemented the fact that everybody screws up and this is how you fix it. Yeah. And it's got, you know, um, some, some fixes from Steve Latta. Uh, I think Michael Fortune's in here. But it's just everyone going through like, yeah, this is, this is how I fix this problem that I've created. And whether it's something as, uh, you know, putting the groove in the wrong side of a tail I, or, or in the wrong side of a drawer, I've never done that. But apparently some people do that. But just, you know, just getting <laughs> dense out. And well, well, well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do plenty of others. Don't worry. It just... It, <laughs> It's not really just the individual fixes, which are great, but it's just that guys like me who are, you know, at times struggling to figure out style and things like that or, or a technique, if you miscut a piece of joinery, it's not the end of the world. This is how you fix it. Move on. Don't do it again. Um, it also shows that even the pros make mistakes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, there's a, a follow-up to that article as well. I think the I think it may have been titled "Fixing Joinery Mistakes." I think it was more specific. Another great um, article full of tips on, you know, recovering from miscut joints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a few in here, um, and there's stuff that we've talked about on the podcast before. Just using yeah. a piece of veneer to sham out a drawer that was undercut, things like that. Um, but these are all problems that that everyday woodworkers struggle with. What issue and, was that again? Um, that was in 228. Oh, an awesome Sh issue. Should we see the back cover? Yeah, it was on what the is back it? Oh, that's also oh, fantastic. Yeah. That's a, yeah. Yes. I remember that you one. You can too. show that on the in the video, right? No, we're just going to talk about it. Yeah. And we're never going to say what it is, but no. it's it's, ama it's the most amazing thing ever. Yeah. It actually has, it solved, it, it ended in several wars when I have it came to out. My it's, eyes. it's bigger <laughs> than life. <laughs> All right, I do love that. That, back, that that's it's, another it's a, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Every back cover from fine woodworking is amazing. Yeah, 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 there's a clinker every now and then. There was the uh, fish no, coffin. There's, there's no clinkers. The flying corn cobs. All right, easy. Let, let's move on. <laughs> let's, uh, John doesn't it, listen. So. <laughs> it's time for some listener and viewer comments, both good and bad. This one comes from James. It would be nice if the podcast was in metric. Imperial kills me every time you talk in that foreign language. I say it, so. We, Hello, should, governor. we should speak in metric. <laughs> you put that in there just to say, Hello, Governor. I did. Governor. I did. Right, right. Tea time, um, boys. And Jordan chimed in with listening to this week's Shop Talk Live. I had to stop myself from bursting out loud so many times. You guys nailed it. I don't know what he's talking about, but right. apparently something happened. He, said he was listening to a different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> he was on the wrong dial. Um, Chase points out his all time favorite. Oh, wait, his all-time favorite quote of all time. And he says, uh, if you don't have electricity, you just get yourself a cross saw and a hipster, and you can do all the work you want to, and a case of PBR. <laughs> Seriously, I might have to carve that into some crotchety maple and put it on the wall of my shop. And I, I'm thinking, should be spurtled I think, maple. I think Matt <laughs> said that, right? I did say yeah. During yeah. the last, that was during the last one. Cross-cut yeah. saw. Yeah. The, I, I no, just, no, you said cross saw. Oh, I did. Yeah, 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 I, was, yeah. Spoke. I, I, I was listening to that. Yeah. In, uh, it, it, the wild of nice Montana. Stylistically. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and on that note, we'll wrap up this episode of Shop Talk Live. Tune in again in two weeks on August 5th for our next episode. While you're eagerly awaiting our next show, remember to visit finewoodworking.com to keep up with the tool giveaway for our 40th anniversary. The current prize is an 18 volt drill driver kit from Rigid Tools. To win it, you must enter by July 25th. To enter, go to findwoodworking.com slash 40 sweeps. That's number 40. You can catch the podcast via iTunes. You can also stream each program on the web at shoptalklive.com or catch us on iHeartRadio. Finally, keep up with Fine Woodworking on Instagram and on Facebook and look for all of us on Instagram as well. Thanks for listening and have fun in the shop. It's Goat Boy. <laughs> <laughs> go, kiss <a> <laughs> go, go kiss a goat, Frank.